I find it fascinating that you say that the it's it wasn't the artist that it was really about you know uh the music piece and and so I what think was, so yeah yeah so what was it about the kinks you really got me duh, 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 duh. I could play it <laughs> yeah it was just dead simple and then it went duh, 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 duh. you know it went up a tone it was all really easy that that was it of course I loved the records funnily enough I met uh and got to know very well uh Shel Taumi who who was uh their producer and the who and a few other people besides obviously and um this Purely coincidentally, I, I got to know him very well. He used to stay in my house a lot. In, so in... later on, when you built this studio and it's starting to, it's starting to, let's say, have a little bit of success in the sense that you can buy new equipment and you can build any more. How did you then, uh, if I can sort of term it this way, how did you slide into <laughs> production? Uh, well, it, I, I didn't know what any of it meant. And at the studio, this group came in. Uh, this was really early on, uh, called Sniff and the Tears. And they came in with... Uh, Driver's a, Seat? A, yeah. That's amazing track. Yeah, I love yeah. that track. So, so that album, um, they came in with a guy called Barry Farmer, who was called Baza, who was from a studio... Oh, I forget the name. It was a really, really successful little eight track studio where Stiff Records and Chiswick Records, you, you, not Gateway. I can't remember the name. It'll come to me. Used to do loads of made loads of records and demos. But for some reason, they wanted to come to our studio. And um, uh, Baza, Barry, uh, he, he was pretty hands off. And I was sitting trying to, you know, pretend I knew what I was doing, engineering. And, but I couldn't help but offer suggestions because I was a guitar player, really. And they had two guitar players. So I'd be endlessly offering up ideas. And after, you know, they were sort of going along with my ideas. They were happy for me to do this. And um, when it came to driver's seat, uh, that we were mixing it, and and I discovered, God, I've said this before, it sounds so stupid, I discovered the mute button because the guitars, they were playing riffs throughout the whole song. And I suddenly realized if I muted the riffs in where Paul Roberts was singing, it changed the whole perspective of the song. And, and it's, it didn't happen by accident. I sort of thought it through and then because I was a guitar player, I knew how to hit the mute button. It wasn't on the beat. You know, it wasn't like one, two, three, four, mute. It was do, 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 three, four, one, mute. You know, it was the, that was one riff, and the other riff happened in another place. And I could do it. I had the dexterity, the musical dexterity, to be able to mute these two guitars and open them at the right spot. So they came in at the beginning of their riffs. And it was a magical moment because it suddenly changed this relentless thing into, into a format. Uh, and, and I ended up with, with or being told I had a production credit. Uh, and the other thing, which was another complete fluke, was putting a big reverb on the snare at the front, which, <laughs> I, I believe it was long before Start Me Up, which Bob Clearmountain did. Oh, you know, he did the same trick. A trick. It wasn't a trick. It was just something that happened. And it sounded great. So it, it became this sort of gymnastic mix, you know, the mute button on the, on the send and then the mute buttons on the guitar and other people riding stuff. Anyway, and that became a big hit. And uh, I didn't realize I was producing records. I was doing whatever I'd always done because in the bedroom, it was, hey, why don't you try doing this and I'll do this and then, you know, let's put a harmony here. And uh, so it was all the same stuff really, but didn't have a label. Then Paul Roberts said, would I produce a second Sniff and the Tears album? 
And I suddenly thought, oh, maybe that's what this is all about. Maybe that's what I'm what what I'm doing here. I'm a record producer, well, kind of. And from that point on, uh, even even though that was a complete disaster, that album because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I suppose that's what I became, even though I couldn't get any jobs. So I'd produce my, you know, I'd make my own records and friends records and nothing happened until I got a call from, or to work with Trevor Horn. Now you say that you didn't know what you were doing at that point with that second album. Um, the thing is, you also sort of mentioned you didn't know what a producer was. So what did you learn from that process in terms of what a producer is? I mean, I can't define what a producer does. Maybe you can tell me what a producer actually does. Uh, who knows? Yeah, who knows? exactly. I, I suppose the answer is deliver a record. Right. M maybe it's that broad. De deliver something that, that people want to hear, maybe. But even to this day, it's, well, everything's changed, as we know, but but maybe, uh, I don't know, some records I've made, I've just been a therapist, other records I've made, I've done everything, it, it, whatever it takes, really. And it, it is, uh, I'm always amazed at people, I, I, I met Dr. Luke a long time ago, uh, when I was working at Psalm and he was stuck every day, he was in the next room to me. So I'd see him most days. And whenever I saw him, he was studying billboard. And, um, I realized to him, he, he made it very scientific, this record production. It, it was a, it was as much of a science as an art. I I've all I've ever done is do I like it? Yeah. I like it. You know, taste really. So do you go in with any preconceived ideas? I mean, I come on to Trevor Horn and we get on to that in a second. But in terms of going in, you know, like if you're going to work with an artist, do you go and do all your research? <laughs> well, it depends. I mean? It depends who it is. Right. Every, everyone's different. With, um, uh, for example, Simple Minds, no. But Annie Lennox, yes. I had I had a very very vague uh, idea that I put to her before we started her first record, and that idea was the guitarist. You're no longer with the guitarist in the band, so let's not have any guitar. You know that that yeah. was a pretty vague starting point. But so that was for her to get away from the sound with Dave Stewart, in a sense, to take way, her away. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, or or to look at it, to flip it on its head, to for her to to be her, you know, because she's a keyboard player, so so not having guitar meant we were leaning more on keyboards. It didn't work out that way, but it doesn't really matter, you know. It gave us a starting point. Okay, I'll come back to uh, Annie Lennox in a bit, but just to go to Trevor Horn, where was he in his life? when you met him because he, he became... just yeah, i'll tell you exactly where he was i think he'd done yes uh, abc and he just started ztt and I, I i don't know the timeline well enough but but i think the art of noise was something that had been going on while he was making these other records you know duck rock uh ABC, don't think I had the fair light then. They might have, I'm not sure. But certainly 90125, uh, they'd got samples from, you know, Alan White or whatever. They, 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 the art of noise was consisted of the people who, he, he, his team messing about. So that and was then Paul, Paul Morley as well then? Well, Paul Morley came up with the name. And once they had a name, it made sense of their messing about and then and then trevor could get involved in a in a uh, i suppose as an editor more than anything to to make something out of what they'd done i've probably got that wrong and and jj or ann or gary will say oh no no it wasn't that at all but that that's the impression i got and i remember i only had worked on one thing 
it, it was probably Moments in Love, a remix, and it was just basically editing, loads of editing that we did. What was his style of working and how did that correspond to who you were at that time? Uh, well, he had bigger budgets and, and, uh, and, and much, much, much bigger ideas and uh, understood the importance of rhythm. And those three things I, I remember um, being amazed at, how much time he kept talking and thinking about the rhythm, which I'd never really done. I thought, oh, drums, yeah, we'd done the drums. But he would spend ages on, on thinking about what rhythm it should be and what the bass should be. And, and, and of course, I learned that from him. Also, uh, because he had uh, the ability to command big budgets, I, I, I'm not sure that that's relevant, but at any rate, he had time. He could take his time and would do things which happen with relax, start again. I'd never start again. I, I, you know, once you'd started, that was it. You know, there wasn't the time or the money or the wherewithal to start again, but he with relax we started again so he would literally say this isn't working we start from the beginning start from the beginning again yeah wow 